פרשת פנחס. פרשת פנחס does not really deal with the action that Pinchas did. We learned somewhat a little bit about it, you know, last week, but more the reaction to what he to what he had done, and his reaction to what was taking place there, in a way you might call it uh, something like a Zen riddle. Uh, you know, with a, with a little paradox or a twist that by having its nature like this, it allows us to interpret what exactly took place there in many different ways and many times they're completely opposing, I guess, as different, you know, different uh, validity to each. The Pasuk says, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Aaron HaKohen השיב את חמתי מעל בני ישראל, וקנאו את קנאתי בתוכם. הקדוש ברוך הוא says that Pinchas, you know, so on and so forth, the son of, uh, was able to calm me down when he was zealous for me uh, when I was angry with the Jews. And he says, ולא חיליתי את בני ישראל בקינתי, and I did not abolish the Jews with my zealousy. לכן, therefore, I tell him, right? הנני נותן לו את בריתי שלום. I'll give him my covenant of peace. I'll tell you, this is like maybe one of the most bizarre psukim out there, and such... You need to really look into it. Really, really look into it. On the surface, the concept of zealousy, what we call kanai, zealousy, is, uh, and, the, and the concept of peace, and I'll call it peace, okay? We spoke about it a million times, and peace, harmony, and so on. I'll get into this now. But the concept of zealousy and the concept of peace are, are on the surface are completely opposing to one another completely opposing to one another one is zealous, one is peace and so on where, and the reason is because zealousy seems like a act of uh, aggression militant aggression and the peace is just the opposite of war so which makes really no sense. I mean, if, if, was so zealous, so why do you give him peace now? I mean, he's, and the contrast between zealousy and peace, you should know, is even more acute than the uh, opposing forces of war and peace. Zeal zealousy and peace is more of a contrast than war and peace. And the reason is because war could be uh, sometimes a defense. And, you know, somebody's attacking me, so I'm going to war as defensing myself. I'm going to war to protect myself. Um, I'm going, I can go to war because I'm very, uh, let's say... Uh, a question. It's my drasha, not yours. I don't need help with words, unless I ask for them. Anyway, an act of work could be an act of really being uh, more subtle, you know. I have to do it, you know, we have to go to war to, to, you know, to stop a certain deterioration from happening, right? For example, there was deterioration in the world, the United States went to war. Not because they were, let's go to war on the country, because they are not a war-hungry nation. <laughs> Uh, where zealousy is just the opposite of that. Zealousy is a straightforward attack, straightforward aggression. It's all about aggression. And zealousy really uh, contradicts and does not like what we call, you know, being moderate. It, it, it can be modern. You have to be zealous. And not only not being modern, but also like uh, appeasing 
And, you know, we can't do it. We've got to appease. You know, we don't negotiate with terrorists. You know, all kind of stuff like that. If you, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the parasha from really, from the time that the parasha was given until, until today, it's really two forces or two groups of people that interpret uh, and, and support or go against those two approaches. There are those who said, oh, be konoi, konoi, you know, be zealous. You know, you, you've been in Yerushalayim, right? Everybody, if you give somebody, you, you know, you, give, you can call them whatever you want. As long as you say, konoi, Allah, he's beside them. He's, he's happy with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for calling me konoi, you know, being zealous. Uh, and some saw it being a very positive thing. And where peace comes as a reward at the end of the war. And those who were against zealousy, right, so as a, uh, uh, some kind of like a, an ailment, a lack of alignment, that you need to have medicine, and they would interpret that that's why Kadosh Baruch Hu gave Pinchas, the Shalom, because it was so unbalanced, so we need something to balance it out, because zealousy is like a disease. And in a way, to a certain extent, in a way, to a certain extent, like the difference today between liberals and, and conservatives and so on and so forth. It's two almost unbridgeable uh, camps that are not really there. And by the way, I don't think there was always, there was ever a center. It's just that they weren't so zealous to one one angle or another, there was never a center. As a matter of fact, I think if you look at this America at a certain point, it was much more conservative than it was liberal. And I guess that's what brought America to where it is. Now, uh, from a, uh, from a uh, aspect of values or morals, according to this, uh, to this uh, notion, uh, zealousy is really a negative thing. It's a negative approach. A person should not be zealous. And in a way, it is a blemish in your personality that really needs some kind of a cure and some kind of a fixing. Now, just have this in mind, put it to the side one second. Now, if we're going to look at the actions of what happened there between Zimri and Cosby, there are a few questions I'm not quite sure I'm going to be able to address all of them now because I wasn't meant for that. I just bring a few questions that are quite bizarre. Some of them actually start in the end of last week's parasha in the actions that, uh, and we'll see. So the first one is, I just don't understand this guy. What's his name? Zimri. I don't understand him. If you wanted to do an Avera, if you wanted to do a Chet, go somewhere in a tent, you know, in the back of the tent somewhere, you know, in a cave somewhere. Go do what you want to do and uh, be done with it. Why do you have to do it in a public place in, in such a way that it's going to be very, uh, very dangerous? I mean, it's very dangerous and it's much more severe. You have to agree with me. A person who does it out in the open is much more severe than if you would do it in the hiding of, the, of his tent or you know, cave or whatever they were doing in it. Why do you what, what what goes into the mind of a person like that? Of course, everything that we are talking about about the parasha has to do with what we're experiencing today. So Rabbi, pay attention. What goes into the mind of a person like this? Another question that I have really comes in last week's parasha. What does really Shevet Shimon want from him? Right in in last week's parasha. In Perek Hafei Pasuk Vav, Bnei Shimon come to him and they complain, you know, we are, we are all sentenced to death and, you, and you're doing this? I mean, there's different with Rashi there. Rashi asks certain questions based on Chazal that according to the Midrash, they, they, they kill something like, I don't know, 80,000 people, whatever it is, uh, for Avodah Zarah. 
and 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 this is the din. This is what this is what needs to be done. This is what you're doing. And after after the Bnei Shimon come to him, what did Zimri do? Zimri says, "Oh, Avinu Malkenu Chatanu." But what did he do? He prayed. He daven. He brought ktoret and nothing. He didn't do anything. He went and did chet because Bnei Shimon saw what he was doing, what was happening. I mean, let's look at this this way. We never, we always skip that part. But Bnei Israel were mezanim with the Midian, with the Midianiot. The Bnei Shimon coming to Zimri complaining. So Zimri, instead of saying, oh guys, listen, let me check, you know, like a sheriff coming in, check, whatever. What does he do? He goes there and does the other by himself. I mean, I don't know, what do you think? What's wrong with you? Do something to it. That's what a leader does. Imagine, you know, somebody, oh, listen, over there, they, they're beating each other up. They, you know, there, there's a few guys, are, you, know, you have a group, let's say an army or whatever. So in your battalion, there's two guys over there, you're the commander, they're really beating themselves up, they're killing each other. So what are you going to do? You're going to stop beating everybody around you? <laughs> it's very bizarre. What's wrong with it? And <clears throat> another one is, you know, after all, he was Rosh Bet Av. Rosh Bet Av, and the Gemara says that he was Rosh Shevet. He was the, the head of the tribe. He was a chieftain. And the Gemara says his name was really Shlumiel Ben Tzuri Shaddai. So if he was such a, such a Hashubo person, so for sure he knew the Halakha. He wasn't. The guy wasn't a Namaharez. For sure he knew the Halakha. And if he knew the halacha, so how can he act with such chutzpah, with such nerve? How can he do such a thing? He didn't understand, he wasn't afraid of what could have happened to him or they're going to execute him. I mean, he knew. What, again, what was going in his head? Many times, his head is our head. Whether, again, it's personal or it's more on a national level, you'll see that that's what it is. And, and the last one is, what does it really mean when we say the expression, Maray Masechet Sotah in Daf? Daf? Anybody? Bet? Chav Bet. No way. Daf? I said that. Chav Bet, Daf? Amud, I'm sorry, Amud? Bet! Joshua, guys, you want to make rock and roll? Let's have a chavbet amubet, yes. I can't believe that. Then I have a tough, a tough one for you later on. But so the Gemara in Masechet, in Masechet Sota, in Dav Chavmet Bet, it says, Ma pirush, what does it mean? Ose maase zimri, u mevakesh sachar ke pinchas. Ma ave amina. What do I get out of this? You're doing... You're doing, acting like a, acting like a... Behema. thank you for that, I take that, good. <laughs> acting like a behema. And then you, you, you call yourself a tzaddik, right? Calling yourself a unificator of, of Am Yisrael, meanwhile you divide them, right? Call yourself the biggest Kiruvnik, and then you push them away. Call, you, you know, you get the drift, right? I mean, you see, we have a lot of guys like that. So what does it really mean? So there was a guy in Yerushalayim, it wasn't a guy, I shouldn't say a guy. There was a tremendous, tremendous Talmud Chacham. His name was Abrav Yosef Zonenfeld. They named many streets after him. And he says that Zimri came with a very hard complaint to, with a harsh complaint to Moshe Rabbeinu. He says, everybody that gets killed in Beit Din and in Magifa, in the disease that happened because of that, he said, it's not because of the znut with Benot Moab. It's not because of the actions that they do with the Moabite girls. But he says, it's because the Avodah Zara of the Peor. The reason why they're dying is because of Avodah Zara. They're not dying because of znut. And uh, look again, look at Rashi over there in Perik Hafei Amutbet. And he says, because what happened, Brot Midian would invite the Bnei Israel to their tent, but they would condition their, you know, handing themselves over to be violated for 
for the fact that they're going to, the Jews are going to do uh, Avodah Zarah for Peor. And that you can find the story over there in Masechet. Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, Dav. Pei Bet. Pei Alf. Ein Bet. Pei Bet No, sorry. In Kuf Vav Amud Alef. I'll get to And therefore Zimri, so there Zimri was, a, he thought it was a Uber Chochem. So Zimri had a tremendous suggestion. He says, let's bring Brot Nidian. Let's, let's bring them into the camp of the Jews. Let's bring the Binyanite girls. And pay attention, which, you know, you might ask, I really don't understand. It was Bot Bodot Moab, and then it's the Midianite girls. But towards the end, you'll understand exactly what it means. So let's bring him into the tent. Let's bring him into the camp. And by doing so, there's only going to be Znut. And Znut, Le Maise, Znut like this, is only Karet Midivre Sufrim, right? Karet Midera Banan. There is no Dera Banan today. As we'll. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell this to Gemara in Sanhedrin, Dav Pei, Bet, Amud Bet. And look at the Rambam also in the Son of Isurei, Bia, Perek Yud Bet, Alacha Bet. And by doing so, we'll save the Jews from Avodah Zarah and from death. You hear the same concepts today. When they brought a lot of people from different places in the world, and they knew they're not Jewish, and now there's a problem. So let's convert them, and then they can go. But listen, they're not going to be Shomer Shabbat. The conversion is not going to go. That's okay. They convert them. Yalla, yalla. Wow. Get them in the bus. <laughs> Don't make a fuss. Just get on the bus. Many times you see this, this mindset today. Wow. Oh, we're going to save this guy from, from Chas Shalom Karet, and whatever it is is involved with him. So let's be Megayer her. We don't care if they're going to keep Shabbat. Are you going to keep, are you going to keep mitzvot? Right? Yes, very good. <laughs> Just don't forget over there, you know, my pocket feels a little empty today. Let's do that. And, we, and look what he's using. He's using the claim of We'll save the Jews. What would you rather do? Would you rather the Jews to die? You wanted to have a plague? We'll save them. Wow. Right, you hear me over there? The guys in the back. That's the concept of Zimri, or Botai. And that's his, uh, this is his ideology. Let's be flexible. Let's include everybody. We need to understand where they're coming from, right? How many times have I told you? Uh, you guys said to me, Rabbi, a guy comes to keep Shabbat. So he, he's not going to do, so can I tell him to do this and it's okay for him to do that? And I, what did I tell you? No. Well, he can't keep kosher. Can he keep half a kosher? What's that? I don't know what's that. Maybe you can tell me. I have no idea what's that. It's the same thing. Either you mechalel Shabbat or you shomer Shabbat. There's no, I keep Shabbat half. Maze. But that's, 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 the, that's the attitude that, that really derives from that mindset, which is amazing. So, instead of that, so what they say, and, and which you always, we have to go bedach and noam. They always tell you, right? We have to take the middle path, what the Rambam says. What the Rambam said, the okay, middle path, when you have to do the mitzvot, not for you to violate them. Right? We have to be, we have to be, uh, we have to go up with the time, with the, with the spirit of the time. What how things today, it's not like it used to be. Today we need different people. We need more enlightened people. I, you heard this a couple of times. Don't say a word. Right? We have to make reforms. We have to compromise. You can't be machmer, and then you tell them, listen, I'm not machmer, I'm just saying the halacha. There is chumrod, but I'm just saying the halacha, the basic halacha. When, when, what would you say if there's a guy, Chaz Shalom in yeshiva, 
and he has a Goyish girlfriend, and you're going to tell me, well, you can't tell her and tell him to drop her because he might go away. So I go away, but I, I'm going to make him, you know, posher birshut Torah. Why? Because his daddy's going to give me a big check. Don't want it. Tell him, buddy, you know, you're doing something wrong. Yeah, I'll tell him. Because I'm going to tell you this. Later on in Shamayim, when you're going to come to collect your, your prize, your trophies, the guy's going to come and claim to you against you. He says, listen, why didn't you tell me that? What? You tell me I wouldn't listen? How do you know that? You tell me that? Tell me that. Why did you lie to me? I thought I came, and even more so, when I came to ask you a question, I came to ask you a question. And I want you to give me an answer. You, you fooled me. I thought I'm doing the right thing. Well, everything is on you, not on me. So take the trophies out. Go grease down the elevators. You understand what I'm saying to you? How many times have you heard that? We always do compromise. We have to do reforms. We need to do things and so on and so forth and forth and so on. So Zimri says to him, you Moshe, because you are machmir the people, you are machshil them as well. You make them stumble because you are so because you're strict with them. And Moshe was a machmir. Moshe was doing the deed. His claim was to Moshe, Zimri's claim, you are the cause for them to do the Avodah Zarah, and you are the cause for them to die. And we hear this all the time. We hear this all the time. He says to him, don't you understand that Shevet Shimon is not interested in Avodah Zarah? But this is only a condition for the Znut. I am the one who's taking care of my brothers, not you. You failed as a, as a leader. Look how many people died because of you under your, under your uh, you know, leadership. And that's when he says, et And then he took the Midianite to his brothers. Now the Midianite, not necessarily a Midianite, it could be any Isul. And, and, and it be, it he, said, he said to him altogether, if we're going to bring them closer, according to my, my analogy, if we're going to bring them closer, they're going to see the beauty of Judaism. they for sure going to convert. How many times have we heard this regarding guys who married chickses? And we says, no. We'll, we'll be nice to them, and they'll convert. I said to him, Habibi Atama, you know better than the Torah. The Torah says you can't do so because you're going to be in the, so, over the Vodah Zarah. So how are they going to be converting? How many times? There are rabbis, they have plaques all over the place. They go all over the world. They make tons of money. And all they want to do is, is all this shtuyot. Why? Because it's fame and glory. For who? For them, not for Hashem. This, is, this, this stuff comes from, from Zimri. But Zimri, of course, was a mistake. Why? Because, why he was mistaken? Because he legitimizes the sin. He legitimized that. He took the, the sin of a Yahid, of an individual, and now he made it to the sin of many. And a person that caused many people to sin, and that's what... Uh, that's what Baal Akedat Yitzchak said on Parashat Tazdom over there and so on and so forth. He says, he was machshir the chet. He made it okay. And therefore I cannot understand, I mean I understand that people have um, certain urges that they cannot overcome for this reason or the other and I'm not here to judge anybody because of their perversions and so on and so forth. However, if, for example, the Torah said that homosexuality between men and a man is something that is a sin, I feel it for the people. But I cannot tell them it's okay. If I will tell them it's okay, I'm legitimizing a sin that it said clearly in the Torah. And I cannot do that. 
for that matter, I don't see any difference between a person who is a homosexual and that, that has a desire to any other Jew that has a desire to go with some chick, say, I don't know. Here, your favorite, Nicki Minaj. I don't know, any, you know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> that's a desire, and that's a desire. I don't understand. But you cannot come and tell me that it's okay. That it's okay. You're legitimizing the head. And this is the, really the essence of what Zimri is doing. And then he's asking Sakhar like Pinchas. He says, I'm I taking care of the Jews. Meanwhile, he's causing them to, to sin. And he wants the reward like this, the biggest <laughs> Mahzim B'tshuva over there. He thought he saves Am Israel. But really, whoever saved Am Israel is Pinchas. As it says, Velo et bnei Israel bekinati. And Akadosh Baruch Hu comes and gives a testimony. He says that the real tzaddik is Pinchas because he was the one who saved Am Israel, not this clown who wanted to legitimize the sin and say it's all okay, like most of the politicians will do today, legitimizing everything that is wrong. And you got to think yourself, why would you cast a vote for such a person? So, for example, I myself chose to deliberately not to cast a vote in the last few elections because even though that's my right and my duty, but I'm protesting the kind of people that put forward. That's it. If they had a person with more morals, okay, we'll talk. And I'm not talking about parties. I'm not talking about Democrats versus Republicans, Republican versus this one. I'm not talking about I'm talking about a person who would stand for morals, who would have an integrity and would not tell me lies. Now, and that also explains what we said about Chazal uh, regarding to Zimri. Chazal tells us in, uh, in Masachet Sotah, as we said previously, be careful from hypocrites. Be very careful from hypocrites that do actions like Zimri and then they want a Sakhar like Pinchas. They call, Chazal calls them hypocrites. And Rashi explains, Tzadikim mi bachutz, the righteous people on the outside, are mi bifnim. And then wicked people inside. There are many people like this, unfortunately. We need to sift them through. We need to bring them to the light. As much as we need to bring those that are in darkness to the light, we need to expose those people so they won't mistakenly stumble the innocent ones. It is just as an obligation for you to tell a person like this in mitzvah tochecha, as you tell them to give tochecha to a person, and maybe even more so, to a person who is not Shomer Shabbat and trying to help him. And why, so therefore, why was Zimri a hypocrite? I mean, after all, he did everything out in the open. He did it, he was a hypocrite because of something that was very simple. He was claiming that he was acting for the benefit of Am Israel, but really everything that he was driven by was ta'ava, was desire. It was desire. Just plain old good old desire. And also when the Shvatim came and later on disgraced Pinchas and they said because you, his father, his great father was really, uh, was really uh, fattening out uh, you know, little calves for Avodah Zarah or was raising them to make them nice and fat. So the Shvatim you know, kind of disgraced him. The question is asked, one second, what's the connection between this and this? Why are you bringing his grandfather to this action? Say, well, what you did was wrong. Okay, your grandfather did Avodah Zarah. Don't say, well, what do you want from me? He did it. So, they claim him, their claim was that Pinchas destroyed all the good plan of Zimri because his parents, his grandparents, his ancestors, his ancestors were of the Avodah Zarah and therefore he did not 
understand the severity of Avodah Zarah. Where really, he saved them. He didn't destroy it, he saved them. And you should know that the words of Rav Zonofeld has appeared in many, many books. And in not only contemporary books, but also very ancient books. Uh, if you look, for example, uh, uh, the book of Rabbi Eliezer Cohen, Arofe, I'm sorry. Rabbi Eliezer Arofe was a rabbi who was born in the year Resh Ein Gimel, approximately Resh Ein Gimel. His father was Rabbi Eliyahu Arofe. And he was the Chatan of Maharik, Rabbi Yosef Kolon. Uh, at his young age, he moved to Saloniki, where he learned Torah in the yeshiva of Rabbi Yosef Taitzak, which was also the Rabbi of Maran. They learned together with Maran Bet Yosef, and he was considered to be one of his top Talmidim. When he was 26 years old, in the year Resh Tzadik Tet, he became a rabbi and a dayan in Egypt, and that's huge, Rabotai, that's huge. Uh, in that in that Beidin, that was the Beidin of the Radbaz and the Shittah Mekubet, Rabbi Betzalel Ashkenazi, and hanging around the area there as a, as a youngster was no other than the Ari, right? So this is a big guy, right? If you didn't know about him, now you know about him. So Rabbi Eliezer Rofe says, and I'm quoting, Zimri Savar Shelo Neesra Aramit, Rak Kede Shelo Timshoch Laavodah Zarah. He thought, or he, in his uh, uh, hypothesis, was that the only reason why Aramit is Asura Bevia is only because she's going to drag the guy and force him or, or manipulate him to do some idol worshipping. And, uh, and Moshe only killed those who are Nitzmadim Lebal, lebal Peol. That's why, so that's why it's Asura. The Khatam Sofer says that Zimri said, Ani Nasi, I'm a Nasi, I'm a Chashuva guy. I would be able, I would show him, I would show everybody that it's possible to be with an Aramid and not to go after Abu Dazara. I'm, I'm above this. Ani Kvar Avati, I'm immune to this. I don't have to worry about it. And I'll show it to people. And not only that, he said, Ben Puti to Pinchas. And Chamevin, don't you understand that you could attach yourself to a, to a, to a Nochriya, to a Goya, without Avodah Zarah? But Pinchas understood that Am Israel is, is going to go down. And not only that, that there is also by itself an Isur. Remember, I told you this, we were talking about it this week, I think. One day we talk about it this week. Show me a couple when the husband is a Jew and the, and the woman is a Gentile and they don't go to a Christmas party or celebrate Christmas one way or another and have a little tree and, and so on and so forth, right? As a matter of fact, may, most likely the Jew will be the one to initiate to get the biggest tree. We'll go down and take timber, it'll drag it out, <laughs> you know, just to put it in the house. We'll do renovation, call Yonatan to do renovation, to put, to put like a 60-foot tree in his house just to show. That's what Jews do, unfortunately. So it's impossible. It's impossible. Now, we know the story. You know, uh, yeah, I'm almost done. Kind of. We know the story uh, based over Shmuel HaKatan when it says in Mishlei Perek. Zayin. <laughs> and it says, Bin oivecha al tismach. When your enemy is falling, don't rejoice. Bechoshlo al yagel libcha. When he's stumbling, don't rejoice your heart. Why? Pen irae Hashem vera be'enav. It might be bad in the eyes of Hashem. Ve'eshiv me'alav apo. And then Hakadosh Baruch Hu might change on it. And you should look in Pirkei Avot Berek. What are you doing when you do Pirkei Avot here? Sleeping? <laughs> and because over there, when they say when there was the takana of when there was the takana of alaminim, they took Shmuel Akatan, and they took Shmuel Akatan because what he was saying is always quoting that alaminim la mashanim al tiyetikva and so on and so forth. Therefore, only a person that all his life 
he lived his life. That was the rule of his life. When your enemy or your competition fails, don't rejoice. I can think of few examples, I'm walking into it now, that I've seen it, especially in business. There was competition, oh, let them have it, let them have it. Oh, they went out of business. Meanwhile, you know, a few years later, you went down of business. All of a sudden, everything went, hey, why is it crazy? You know, even if you have a competition and it goes out of business, just think about the person, you know. He lost his job now, he lost his business, his family. Maybe at this point, you should actually go and actually help him. Don't rejoice all the time. It's a very, very, that's why we should not do parades. The only thing we should do is say Hallel if there was something like a magnitude of, of like a big siege around the Jews or something like that. And we say Hallel together for the praise of Hashem, but we don't rejoice at that. Right? So only a person that had this in his life could fix <coughs> such a violent bracha, la minim vela mashinim alti etigva, vekola risha, and so on and so forth, mehai, you know. Only a person that is, that understands what does it mean and lives by this statement can, can be metak in such a, such a bracha. And the Rav Kook writes, it says, and by the way, you, you need tremendous, tremendous koach to be able to be mechaven on something like this. I mean, tremendous koach. And, and, and the Rav Kook writes that by us, the, the problem is reverse. If a person does a, a, a violent act, we get, whoa, chazaku baruch, yishar koach, and so on and so forth. And it's a problem. The Natsiv, which was the Rebbe of the Rav Kook, writes the following, In the reward that he kind of quiet down, or calmed down HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him a bracha that from this point and on, he would not get angry, and he would not be makpid on people. Because of what Pinchas did, it left a certain indentation in the entity, in the soul being of Pinchas. And it says, when Maase is a Larog Nefesh Beyado, Kill somebody with your hand. It would stay in his heart even afterwards. But because it was for, it was, this act was a pure act. That he always going to be muy tranquilo and in peace. Botai, I think that the biggest contributor for, or contributors to gun violence are not guns, but rather Hollywood. Mm. Hollywood itself, when they make killing so real, and we're exposed to violence, so real. Those who cry wolves, those Hollywoods people, are the main at fault at these issues of gun violence. And therefore you should filter and be very careful what you're exposing your delicate neshama to. Who does not like to watch MMA, UFC, blood? You know what it is to get beaten up like this? Oh my God. Anybody wants to see? I'll just show you. What time? You can line up one after the other. <laughs> I got the power, right? Well, but I, how can a Jew watch a person like this? 
Yes, he's getting paid, whatever, but how can a Jew see something like this and, whoo, yes, yes. Where is it coming from? And I'm going to tell you something else also. The measure of cruelty that we have to animals is the measure of cruelty we have to people as well. You cruel to animals, you'll be cruel to people. Because it's the act that you find it within yourself to torture, to inflict pain. You need to look at yourself, why is it like that? All the big heroes of wars and so on and so forth, by themselves, before and after, very calm people, not aggressive, not, you know. But that's what made them the heroes. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs to give him a bracha because the act dented his neshama. And after the act of Pinchas, it says, Vayidaber Hashem and Moshe Lemor, Tzeror et amidyanim vehikita otam. You should uh, hold a grudge to the Midianites and you should beat them up. Why? Because they are your enemies. Other when? Hurry up. For what they tricked you in the action of Peor. Al Davar Kosbi Bat Nesim Midian with the story of Kosbi, the, the daughter of the president of Midian, the Torah tells us that we have to revenge from the Midianite to remove all the people out to a war, to remove this stumbling block from us from this point and on. And we know that the Torah is not only Pshat Advarim. We know that the Torah is not only things that you read there and that's what it is like this. We know that the Torah also talks about, about ability of movements, of powers, of energies, so on, that acts upon the human soul as well. So the name Midian reminds us, is similar to the name Dimion, imagination, fantasy. And in all of us, there is this koach of Dimion, this Im imagination that we have that it's good to have an imagination as a kid but as, a, as an adult you have to put it to work you don't become a slave to it and I'll, and I'll show you what I mean because that imagination the power of imagination works on us very very strongly like anything else in the world in the Mionian imagination there is a building power and a destructing power the two opposites and we need to take our imagination and assign it to do Avodat Hashem. And what it says in Yeshayahu, Perek, Yedaled. Pasuk? Bet? Hey. Yedaled. Ah. In Yeshayahu, Yedaled, Yedaled, it says, Adamele Elyon. I would... Imagine, I am superior. I would make myself like Hashem. I'll act in His way. I, 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 I always wonder, I'm sure you see a lot of very classy people, actually not so many, but classy people around you, people who act with dignity and so on and so forth. However, for whatever reason, everybody is taking their ability to to copy and to and to imagine themselves as a thug, as a bum, not as a chashuva person. Why is that? Can you explain to me? Who would you say act with a lot of class? The president? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, live, live. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Find someone who is a real, you know, classy person, acts with dignity and so on and so forth, and try to imagine yourself that you act like him. Instead of playing the role of a thug over there, with your pants down to you know where, and like, Talking to me like you, you know how you're talking. Why would you try to imitate somebody like this? For example, okay. Bill Gates. Okay, Bill Gates, giving. How about uh, some big rabbi? Rabadia, Belsky. How do they conduct themselves? Why don't you conduct yourself like this? Copy, but copy the good. Why are you copying the bad? Adamele Elyon. 
And we have to be very, very careful from this dimyonot, from those fantasies that actually push us away from the good path, Rabbotai. And that's what Rav Nachman says, that in our generation, the name of the Yetzer Hara is Koach HaMedameh, our ability to, to fantasize. Everybody thinks he's a big shot. People still pay mortgage on their house, but they buy a $150,000 car. Yeah. You ask a person, excuse me, how much money you, uh, you put for your retirement uh, at the end of the year? I don't know. What's the maximum, Yossi? Percentage? Yeah. Ah, it's percentage? Huh? 5%? Yeah. Uh, Come on. Or IRA or... I don't know, whatever it is. $12,000? Okay, $12,000. I'm going to ask the guy, excuse me, it's a very good number. It's $12,000. Did you put away to your retirement $12,000? No, man, I don't have money. But you're, you're leasing a car for $1,000. What the hell is wrong with you? <coughs> What's wrong with that? We, Because uh, we are involved in a fantasy. We all want to be big shots. How many of you actually know bourbon or whiskey really good to be able to tell all oh, this and that? Most of you don't. Most of you don't. If I'm going to take, give you a bourbon or whiskey, you won't be able to tell the difference. I'm willing to put money on it. But everybody pretends, oh, yes, I have a collection of uh, 100 bottles of single malt so whiskey. You don't really maybe, you don't know nothing. Nothing. If I'm going to give you, for example, whiskey with water, whiskey without water, you won't be able to tell the difference. And believe me, there is a difference. You're pretending. Everybody's playing a role in a movie that nobody ever going to see. And that's what we are doing. Now, listen, Rebs, don't go away, step off. And that Yetzer Ra puts in the people Dimyonot Shav, false fantasies. Uh, if you have to go, you have to go. go, go. False fantasies, I see he's almost crying. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that Yetzer Ra makes, makes a joke out of them, makes a mockery out of, of the people until the point that they are completely lost in materialism. Completely lost in materialism. They could start as a potential tremendous Bachur or Ben Yeshiva, Bachur, Bachur, Bachur Yeshiva, a good Ben Torah, and then and it doesn't make a difference if you went to Yeshiva or didn't, but you get sucked in into materialism. All you care about is money. It's, it's, and why is this? Fantasies. I know a guy like this has a tremendous voice, very nice Chazan, very, very nice. He just hears two people on Shabbat, Yom Kippur, Tisha B'Av, I don't know when, whatever, you know, Halloween, somebody talks about money, his ears, woo come like this, all this money is, is very from guy, but this is illusion. Why? Because he thinks he's going to become a politician. And therefore, we have to cut the Midianim. We have to go to a war against those illusions that we generate within ourselves to remove this negative power of the false imaginations of fantasies from ourselves completely. And that's why we are Metsuve now to take certain things and certain people and so on and so forth. There was clear instructions of what to do with the Midianim. The same thing, and now if you, if you understand, why was Shmuel so angry at Shaul? Because when we were supposed to kill Amalek, and to remove the doubt from us, then including anything that Amalek had. And we didn't, and we still have a doubt. So all these things are also internally. So of Ashlag, as a general of Rashlag said, that the real control in your life, the absolute control in your life, needs to be that a person is going to have clarity of his thinking, of machshava. His thoughts should be clear. He should see reality the way it is, and he should not be fooled by fantasies. See <coughs> reality the way it is. When I was offered to, to sign 
a multi-year contract when I was uh, Israeli, in the Israeli Air Force. It was very tempting, it was very tempting. But then I wanted to know one thing. I said, I'm going to be, I'm going to be in the Army, in the Air Force for so many years, I would not know if I'm worth something or nothing. I'm going to be in a protected shell that I don't have to make any decisions and everything is by the book and so on and so forth. I want to know what I'm worth. I want to know if I'm a something or I'm a nothing. And if I'm a nothing, well, let me find out that I'm a nothing and then I'll do something about it. But I would rather find out that I'm nothing when I'm 20-something years old and do something about it than to find out that I'm a, think that I'm a something and then find out that I'm a nothing when I'm near 50. Stop fantasizing. Stop living in La La Land. Get in touch and in tune with reality. And especially at the time that we are at. Bena Mitzarim. We are coming into, into a closure now. right? That's the, almost the end of the year. Things are getting a little squeezing now. This is, a, this is the time that Kufa of Dinim. Judgments. It's a, it's a time that all the blemishes are coming out. Yes, yes. Even if people are dressed up not modestly in the street, you see all the blemishes, you see all the cellulitis, you see all this garbage, right? So literally you see all the blemishes. But also the blemishes internally of yourself. You always see those narrow places, between the narrows, those narrow places of the soul. And we have to make our machshava, our thought operate. And that machshava needs to be clear thought. Clear machshava, very clear about what you're doing. That's why also we don't listen to music, which I've been telling you many, many times. We need to increase the koach of ma'asim tovim, of good actions, on the koach of false illusions and bad thoughts. This is the way to change any situation. This is the way that you can change reality. The root of all of that, the root of all these things, is what we were dealing here with Pinchas and I mean with the Zimri and so on and so forth, is is the opposite of our will to receive and the opposite of our will to be mashpia. The real hashpa is not by this sweetness. Of, of desires that you give yourself here all the time. The real hashpa'a is changing the reality by <coughs> clarity of your thought, by understanding what is right and what is wrong, what it is in my koach and my ability to change, to be midabek batov, connect yourself to the good. That's why in our yeshiva we don't have benaz, benaz money. We continue learning all the time. We cannot allow to have a lack of Torah, because the hashpa'a of the Torah is great. And then you have to continue learning, and you continue doing ma'asim tovim, because b'shut zeh HaKadosh Baruch Hu will have his rachamim on us, Amen. and will give us his brito shalom to all Am Yisrael. And this should be le'ilu nishmat avi, mo avi v'ratei et roshi, gedal yamorano ben Matilda, Shabbat shalom to all.